from uh, about 15 years on up, uh, a great deal of my thoughts were uh, basically unshareable. We are all evil in some form or another. Yes, I am evil. Not 100%, but I am evil. My mother was a, a sick, angry, hungry, and very sad woman. I hated her, but I wanted to love my mother. This is Serial Killing, a podcast. Hello again, and welcome to Serial Killing, a podcast. This is Alyssa Carroll, and I am your host and the creator of at serial underscore killing on Instagram, where we go through the life stories of serial killers to see if we might catch a glimpse of why they displayed their famous, vile, and disturbing behaviors. This week's podcast will be on Daniel Camargo Barbosa. Daniel was born on January 22, 1930 in Analema, Colombia. So let's get into some history for that time. 1930 was the first year of the Great Depression. The stock markets crashed the year before. Politicians went into a panic and one senator called for an increase in tariffs. The Tariff Act was then passed by the U.S. Congress, increasing the tariffs charged on foreign goods being imported. In turn, other countries increased their tariffs. In India, Mahatma Gandhi and his followers began the 200-mile march to the salt beds of Jalalpur. This was a non-violent protest against the British rule in India. You see, there was a British monopoly on salt, and India was not allowed to produce or sell salt independently. Also in 1930, there was a new emperor in Ethiopia, and he was best known for his efforts to bring Ethiopia into the international community by joining the League of Nations and then later the United Nations, and he was praised for his attempts to modernize the country. In Argentina, the government was overthrown by a coup. The president was forced out of power as General Jose Felix Uiburu led his troops to the capital and they were met with little opposition. And also this year, our little planet Pluto was discovered. While its planet status was downgraded, I will always count it as one of our planets. It was discovered at the Lowell Observatory in Arizona. It was announced as the ninth planet of our solar system at that time. So this was the atmosphere that Daniel was born into. Daniel's parents were Daniel Camargo Bersenio and Teresa Barbosa. His father was a local businessman who actually made pretty good money. The family would have been considered comfortable, if not maybe a little wealthy. He was the product of his father's second marriage. He did have an older half-sister from his father's previous marriage. Now, when Daniel was just two years old, his mother died, but from what I couldn't find. Daniel's father remarried rather quickly to an adolescent named Dioselina Fernandez and basically just handed toddler Daniel over to his new young wife. Daniel Sr. was disinterested in Daniel and they never really formed a bond. But when his father did interact with his young son, he was described as overbearing and dismissive. This left young Daniel in the primary care of his stepmother. By all accounts, his stepmother was a tyrant, described as abusive and demented. It didn't take much to set her off, and she would punish him for the slightest infraction, frequently and harshly. She wanted a daughter and tried desperately to conceive a child, but found she was unable to have children. 
While she doted on Daniel's older sister, she would turn and whip him with a bullwhip. But once he was old enough to go to school, teachers found that he was rather intelligent. He wasn't a disciplinary issue at school. He was respectful. He made good grades. But at home, if he tried to engage his father in things he learned about at school, his father would tell him to be quiet and that he was useless and a lost cause. So after a while, he stopped trying to have a relationship with his father completely. And in fact, he began perfecting how to lie effectively, becoming pretty talented at manipulating people. He started getting into fights at school and showing a more violent side. And then the turning point. His stepmother forced him to put on women's clothing and then invited his classmates to come and look at him. This was all it took for any credibility and popularity he had at school and he was frequently bullied. He would say that after that, he hated women and everything considered feminine. So when he was a younger teenager, his father sent him off to a quite expensive all-boys private Catholic school in Batoga. He seemed to straighten out a bit, actually, and he began doing very well in school again. Then La Violencia started. It was a civil war that lasted about 10 years, between 1948 and 1958. The Colombian Conservative Party and the Liberal Party fought after the assassination of a politician who was the Liberal Party president candidate for the 1949 election. His assassination sparked the rioting and it is estimated that about 200,000 people were killed during this war. So due to this, Daniel had to drop out of school and get a job to help make money for the family. He started out working as a door-to-door -door salesman and he quickly realized that he was rather good at manipulating people into letting him into their homes or buying whatever he was selling. He was charming and intelligent and it showed so that was Daniel's childhood and while we don't have a super detailed view into it we can still evaluate we have enough to work with according to psychology today a crucial part of a child's growing and maturing into a healthy and well-adjusted adult are the forming and development of intimate relationships. These first experiences lay the foundation that eventually lead to long-term healthy relationships in their future. The roots of a child's ability to form interpersonal relationships begins early and depends on the quality of the relationships that the child has with its parents. We've talked about attachment theory in the past, but basically children need to form a strong attachment to at least one primary caregiver who can provide the unconditional love and support that will allow them to develop relationship skills later. Now, children who lose a parent often deal with prolonged grief and can have long-term emotional problems they are prone to depression and anxiety and they tend to withdraw. And certainly the death of a parent is hard on any child, but it is difficult to really determine how two-year-old Daniel dealt with the death of his biological mother. Very young children might not fully understand what death really means, but they are still very much affected by the loss. It is very important that the child be encouraged to talk and describe their feelings, receive extra affection and attention, you know, none of which Daniel got. Then he very quickly inherited a very young stepmother who was most likely not prepared to be 
you know, thrown into being a mother to a toddler and his older sister. We don't know how old the sister was, but it is reasonable to assume that she was old enough to at least sort of tend herself. She was most likely potty trained, out of diapers, could probably at least make herself a sandwich and so on, much easier to care for than a toddler. And again, just like with Carl Panzram, we see a young boy who could not get any positive attention. So in order to garner the attention from people that he craved, he began acting out in negative ways and it proved successful. Thus, the negative behavior being negatively reinforced. But what the turning point was for him, according to multiple sources, was when his stepmother forced him to wear women's clothing in front of his peers, thus humiliating him. Child humiliation can have long-term devastating effects. Children raised by parents who frequently humiliate them go on to be adults to have depression and anxiety. Humiliation is emotional abuse and normal emotional development is interrupted. Then these children become adults who parent themselves in the same manner that they were parented. Internalized messages from childhood are now ingrained in the adult. Once he was a teen and sent off to a private boys school, he was away from his father's negative stuff and his stepmother's meanness and we saw that he began to, you know, regain some self-confidence. His grades were great and there were no reports of issues there whatsoever. But then the war broke out and he was forced to go back home and work to help the family make ends meet. So let's get back into it. Now, Daniel spent much of his very young adult years just working to help his family. So there's not a lot of information about those very early years. In 1957, when he was 27 years old, he began a scandalous relationship with a young client of his named Alkira Castillo and talked her into renting a house in her name for both of them to live in after only going out on a few dates. They very quickly, back to back, had two children together. But the whole endeavor was much more expensive than he had anticipated. So in 1958, he robbed a shop but was arrested just a few hours later and sent to prison for petty theft. This prison was minimum security. Daniel devised a plan to escape. He simply picked up a clipboard, pretending to be looking it over carefully while following two officers out the door who had just finished their shifts for the day. He returned home and life resumed as if nothing had happened. At some point in 1962, he met and fell in love with a woman by the name of Esperanza. He left his common law wife, Alkira, and their children to be with this other woman. When he found out that she was in fact not a virgin, he was very disappointed though he did apparently love her. So he began to manipulate her, telling her that she could make up her lack of virginity to him by providing him with virgins and therefore he could take their virginity in place of hers. For whatever reason, she agreed to this and they essentially became partners in crime. Esperanza lured young girls to an apartment by lying, then drugging them with sleeping pills so that Daniel could then rape them. They both got away with this for two years and he raped five girls. Only the fifth one turned both of them in to the police. Both were arrested and taken to separate jails. Daniel was sentenced to eight years for sexual assault. 
He was livid, to say the least. And instead of making the correct decision that, you know, perhaps he shouldn't rape little girls, he decided that once he was out, the next rape victims would not walk away with their lives. Daniel, of course, served his time, and in 1972, at 42 years old, he was released and he moved to Brazil. In less than a year, he was arrested for illegal immigration and was deported back to Colombia. Once back there, he began working as a street vendor selling televisions. He did manage to lay low for a couple of years before he decided to strike again. In May of 1974, he was walking and he passed by a school. A nine-year-old little girl caught his attention and he lured her away, kidnapped her. He raped her and then he strangled her. That way, she'd never be able to turn him in. He left her body in an area where he knew he'd be back to be able to dispose of it, but on his trip back to her remains, an officer had followed him, suspecting him of the disappearance. The police saw the body and arrested him on sight. Now, some sources say that he raped as many as 50 other young girls in the two years that he was out of prison, but this is the only one proven. He was, of course, found guilty of the girl's murder and sentenced to 30 years in seclusion in Gorgona, which is an island about 22 miles off the Colombian coast. Guys, this island is beautiful. The island itself is about five and a half or so miles long and roughly a mile and a half wide. During Daniel's time, this gorgeous island was used as a penal colony and the penitentiary was modeled after Nazi concentration camps. They slept on cots with no pillows. The bathroom was just a hole in the floor. The walls in the bathrooms had to be lowered due to all of the rapes and murders that happened in there between the prisoners and the guards could therefore keep a better eye on the men. Trying to escape was an act of suicide between the highly venomous snakes and the sharks that constantly patrolled. Of course, Daniel was still going to try. He had been on the island for 10 years now and had studied the water and its currents and then one day he hid in the bushes on the island and there are two accounts of what he did. One was that he found a random rowboat. The other was that he had put together a rather rudimentary raft of logs tied with jungle vines. But either way, one day later, he was on the Pacific coast of South America. The authorities assumed that he had died at sea and the media reported that he had been eaten by sharks. Daniel ran south toward Ecuador, settled in, and immediately began kidnapping, raping, and murdering little girls. Between 1984 and 1986, he raped and murdered 55 girls and young women. And Daniel was cunning. He selected young girls who were helpless from lower class areas who were searching for work to help their family make some money. He would walk up to them and pretend to be a foreigner who needed to find a preacher in a church on the outskirts of town. He would tell them he needed to give the preacher a large amount of money and offer them a reward if they would show him the way. He would then lure them into a wooded area, rape and strangle them. Some he stabbed, and some he hacked, slashed, mutilated, and dismembered. One young adult woman who struck him in the head with a rock while he was raping her enraged him so much that he decapitated her on the spot and then just tossed her head away. Another victim was gutted, 
with her lungs, kidneys, and heart extracted. All bodies were left out in the elements for the local wildlife to finish off. He made money by selling clothing or valuables that he had taken off of his victims. The local authorities believed the crimes were being committed by organized crime rings or even white slavery rings. Some believed it was satanic cults or rich people who were under the protection of the authorities. But a rumor had begun that the quote, beast of the Andes was trying to beat Pedro Lopez's body count number. In February 1986, the now 56-year-old Daniel, who had literally just raped and murdered a young girl, emerged from a wooded area and, much to his surprise, found himself standing in front of some policemen. They saw his kind of shocked and taken aback reaction. They immediately noticed he was acting suspicious and so they searched him. They found, inside of a bag he was carrying, bloody clothes from his victim and, oddly, a copy of the book Crime and Punishment. He was, of course, arrested immediately. Daniel ultimately confessed to murdering 71 girls and young women in Ecuador after he had escaped that island. He showed absolutely no remorse or regret during his confession. He stated that he wanted virgins, quote, because they cried, unquote. He stated that he hated women and wanted revenge on women's unfaithfulness. In 1989, he was sentenced to only 16 years, which was the maximum sentence available for murder in Ecuador. He was actually sent to the same prison as Pedro Lopez had been to. Daniel's cellmate was none too thrilled to be rooming with him, and in November 1994, he forced him to stand on his knees. The man said, quote, it is the hour of vengeance, unquote, then stabbed Daniel eight times, killing him. He then cut off one of his ears and kept it as a trophy. When asked about it, the cellmate said his aunt had been one of Daniel's past victims. So 64-year-old Daniel was buried in a mass grave because no one would come forward and claim his body for burial. It is believed that Daniel Camargo Barbosa raped and murdered up to 150 girls in Colombia and Ecuador combined during the 70s and the 80s. He was a pedophile and sources labeled him as a psychopath. While his childhood was not great, his father basically wanted nothing to do with him and on the rare occasion he did, his father was dismissive and impatient. His mother died when he was just a toddler and his stepmother was cruel. Now, one would think that if he were to grow up and go on a murderous rampage, punishing women who were not virgins, he wouldn't rape and murder virgins. But he stated that he did this to untouched girls because they cried. He had also said that women who were not virgins had STDs and diseases and whatnot. So who exactly was he punishing? Not his stepmother for her cruelty, not his father for him not being there, not his sister, and certainly not his biological mother. I think, and this is just my own personal opinion, he killed because he got off on it. I think he was a pedophile, and I agree with the statement he made about virgins not having diseases. I believe he was just a pure, pedophilic psychopath. But what do you think? Leave me a comment on Instagram, at serial underscore killing, or YouTube under the same name of this podcast. You can visit my website at serialkilling.squarespace.com, and also consider sponsoring the podcast. 
It takes many, many hours and a lot of work to gather the info, but I love it. And thank you so, so much for listening. I appreciate every single one of you because I know you could be listening to anyone else, but you chose me. Thanks and have a great day.